was inspired by a photo of Blue Lagoon. It made me feel like I was walking into nature. I felt exposed, like I was part of landscape, even though I've never been there. Our transect encompasses the area from Panola through Kunawara, Glenroy, Stran, Bulagoon and Narakot. Bulagoon is one of the largest wetlands in Australia, supporting a rich assemblage of about 150 bird species. There are several Aboriginal tribes near Bulagoon who are sustained by its water. Bulagoon supplied them with food, reds to weave baskets from, wood for spears, and so on. Nothing remains there today to tell us of their presence. When Europeans came to Bulagoon, the Aboriginal people had gone. The new population had never known them, never seen them in their environment. Europeans soon realized the importance of Bulagoon and attempted to make it their own. Although this created conflict between the farmers, hunters and conservationists, much of these issues have been resolved now. The lagoon protected the first European settlements from fire, while the wind blowing across them offered a cool breath in summer. Although the lagoon is surrounded by farms and is visited by tourists every year, it remains in pristine condition. Kunawara is famous for its terra rosa soil and the wineries they grow there. Below Kunawara is Panola, where St. Marie MacKillop and Father J.T. Woods lived for a time. Marie MacKillop was the first Australian nun though she is better known for giving recognition and respect to Aborigines in South Australia. During the gold rush, the Chinese passed through the Panola to reach the Victorian gold fields. Unlike the Chinese, Scottish farmers arrived in robe and spread onto our transacts, bringing their farm animals, plants and culture which can still be observed today. For example, Strong and Glenary are named after places in Scotland. Naircourt offered a good meeting place for Aborigines. Naircourt lies on the border of at least three tribes, while the Naircourt caves offered shelter for them. Many of the roads used today in the lower southeast were used by Aborigines. Although little evidence remains in the region, and none at all in our transact. What we do know is that at least three Aboriginal tribes bordered onto our transact, the Potoro Wood, the Mayantang, and the Bowendig. Although Tyndall mapped out these tribes, their boundaries vary according to the season and fires, among other factors. During droughts, many tribes hunted at Bull Lagoon, especially the Potoro Wood, who had particularly poor land, even the tribal names vary, as they were called different names by each other. Although each tribe had a distinctive culture, they spoke essential the same language, had a common kingship system, and shared major ceremonies and religious rites. Instead of writing down agreements, they formalized them through songs and dancing, where requests were made using message sticks. Our panel is an exercise in culture mapping. Over the semester, we have read about different processes for mapping. Maps are not simply a representation of landscape. They also reflect the ideas and social culture of creator. Whenever we lost our way, the reading guided us, and we hope to share our experiences with you. It's not quite as simple as I thought it would be. I stepped up a high step. I stepped up a car into a chill. I walked upon a path. The 
artwork was made through a combination of tissue paper, paint, polycarbonate, and MDF board. We used the tissue paper to create texture and an organic feel. The flexibility of tissue paper and paint allowed us to adapt our design as our idea and understanding transformed. At first, our artwork was very literal. As we incorporated more information, it became more complex. Every element in the artwork has a story. In particular, we were interested in the relationship between these stories and how they strengthened the idea that Boo Lagoon is a basis for reconciliation between cultures, regardless of their background. This is not the place I was expecting This is not exactly what I thought I would see